Um, you see a nice guy standing beside of me. He has a mission. He wants to go to the moon, or well, he wants to set a, send a robot to the moon. This is Carsten Becker, and I think he has earned a nice applause because they are really working on this. <laughs> and he now wants to say something about that it may be a good idea to test things and not only the software, because it may be a good idea to uh, know how you can free the robot if it is struck somewhere before it is on the moon. Have fun. Thanks. Moin, everyone. Uh, I'm Carsten from the team Part-Time Scientist. Um, yeah, we're a bunch of people that want to send a robot to the moon, and uh, we have been working on this mission for like five years now. So just four years ago, when uh, we went to the CCC camp, um, we had our little rover and our two rover, and uh, now we have been progressed further. We have uh, now a bigger one and pretty cool one. But what I want to talk about today is actually how do you test the rover? You know, how do you not just test the components of the rover, but how do you do a more thorough um, test of all the components involved? And so um, this is what an analog mission simulation does. Uh, it's not, you know, it's not related to those analog sun vibes or anything. You know, it's it means that you are recreating the environment um, as close as possible uh, as you can to test something on Earth. You know, some some parts are uh, difficult to recreate. You know, for example, having a big um, vacuum chamber where you can actually drive in, and uh, others are downright impossible to get right. For example, gravity. You know, it's very hard to get rid of it. Um, so, but first, uh, maybe I should, you know, show a little bit around what uh, what we have done so far. And uh, luckily for me, there is a there is a video which perfectly demonstrates what we are actually planning to do. A trip to the moon is not easy. First, the enormous gravitation of Earth has to be overcome. Then, hundreds of thousands of kilometers are waiting to be crossed, full of harsh darkness, the intense radiation of the sun, and extreme temperature changes. The part-time scientists, a private team of engineers, are working on mastering this journey and winning the Google Lunar X Prize. Audi is supporting them in the competition to build a lunar rover and send it to the moon to fulfill a number of tasks. In order to leave the Earth once and for all, the two moon rovers are loaded into a satellite launch vehicle. They are mounted into the top because this is the optimum position to survive the enormous forces during the launch. The Dnieper rocket launches with incredible thrusts of 4,520 kilonewtons and speeds of up to 7.8 kilometers a second until it reaches the lower orbit at 300 kilometers. There, the service module is released. This part of the rocket will carry the moon rovers into space. To leave the Earth's gravity, the service module orbits our planet in ever-growing ellipses. Then it catapults away and starts its five-day-long journey to the moon at speeds of up to 10.5 kilometers a second. While the moon is often portrayed as being fairly close to Earth, it is, in fact, around 384,400 kilometers away. That's enough space to fit every other planet in the solar system between Earth and the Moon. The module carrying the two rovers approaches the Moon at high speed and enters its orbit at a precisely calculated angle. Once this task is completed, the spacecraft can prepare for the last part of the journey, the landing. The landing module separates from the service module and starts the critical landing process. The part-time scientists chose the landing site years ago, the Taurus Litro Valley near the Apollo 17 landing site, an area well known by scientists and lunar explorers. In science fiction movies, landers simply descend to the lunar surface. But in reality, the lander is still orbiting the moon at a speed of 1.7 kilometers a second until the final landing sequence is initiated. The landing is the most crucial part of the journey. While slowly descending, precisely calculated rocket thrusts slow the lander down as it approaches its final landing site. Once the lander has touched down safely, it detaches the two rovers, which bathe in sunlight first and then call home. Their journey to the moon took more than eight years of development, planning and engineering work. 
Now, the real mission can begin. But what will the rovers do on the moon? And what are the challenges on Earth's ancient satellite? We'll explore this in more detail in our next episode. Yeah, so uh, if you know anything about um, trajectory planning or how uh, landers actually land, then I apologize for the graphics. Um, they are not up to detail uh, in some parts, you know. Uh, but I, I think it's a good visualization. It's a good visualization of um, how we are going to approach the moon. And uh, some of the things that changed since our presentation at the uh, 31st, um, uh, 31 C3, um, we have uh, won the milestone prize award that uh, we were talking about back in December. So um, that gave us like 750k um, US dollars. So that's pretty neat. Um, this talk is about uh, the uh, analog mission simulation. And the, when, you, when you're landing on the moon, um, there are many, many things you have to do. So there are many phases involved. You know, there is, for example, the pre-flight phase, where, you're, um, where you have to make sure that you're fueling up the rocket, you're bringing it to the launch site, uh, the, the payload to the launch site. The, launch site um, the payload gets integrated into the rocket. And then eventually, the flight starts. So, um, we will be uh, delivered to the low Earth orbit when we are flying with the NEPA or a little bit uh, further out when we are using another one. And then, you know, there is like seven days of waiting. But eventually we will come to the phase two where it's about to land. Uh, this will be very interesting. But it's also very hard to the flight and uh, the landing are also the one that are nearly impossible to recreate on Earth. So um, what follows is the, what we call the primary operations, which is um, the one where you can actually you know, collect the 30 millions from Google, uh, which is about uh, driving 500 meters, sending back HD video. And, uh, and then we will carry out, uh, when we have, once we have collected the money and have done the party, then we will go on with regular science stuff, you know, like making experiments and uh, do all the cool stuff. Yeah, eventually our mission will end probably with the first, uh, with arrival of the first lunar night, um, because the changes are, the uh, in temperature are so high that we don't expect our rover to survive. You know, it might react on the next mon uh, Monday, Monday, with, uh, with like, hey, I am still alive, but you know, there is only hope, not uh, no guarantees. So yeah, and then the mission is over. So what we, in an analog mission simulation, um, uh, for example, for the primary operations, uh, what, you want to uh, what you want to test is, for example, the operations that are happening once you've touched down. So there's uh, the self-test of the rover where you make sure that um, everything is working as you expect. And then there is uh, there's some uh, deployment. You, so you, uh, as you saw, the rover are attached to the base of the lander. And so they're like bloop, dropping down. And um, then we make sure that all the communications are working, and eventually we will try 500 meters and send back HD video. Uh, this is something that you can actually test on Earth, and uh, this is also what uh, what our friends of uh, of OVF, for example, are doing. They have done the MRD uh, test of their uh, space suit for Mars operations. And they do it uh, always in some mountains uh, where they can do some skiing, probably, while they are doing this. I don't know. Um, I actually wanted to have, you know, like, uh, like a live chat with those guys uh, wearing uh, the suit, but unfortunately, they just finished uh, their, their test. So, well, uh, this won't work, unfortunately. Um, usually, we keep our engineers tightly, uh, you know, in a room with... Uh, doing science stuff, but, you know, occasionally we go on an adventure, you know, and uh, this is how our analog mission simulation looks like. So what we want to test on an analog mission simulation is how can you actually um, traverse in an unknown terrain, you know, it's, it's very easy when you're, when you're walking around uh, behind the rover to see what it's doing, but it's another thing if you have no idea where it is. Um, 
also we have those drop containers that could be deployed and some mission control that needs to work. Uh, and also, uh, the old tests are actually about um, collecting plenty of data. So this is, for example, one of the sites where we did some testing, which is uh, in Tenerife on the Tide Mountain. It's pretty cool because there is no, absolutely nothing man-made uh, in this picture there. So that's pr except the people. Um, uh, so that's pretty cool. Uh, but to drive around with just the two cameras that you see in the rover is actually pretty tough, as we figured out. And so one of the changes that we are making for the next iteration of the rover is to have a camera sitting on the bottom of the rover so that we can see all four wheels. Because we found that you know, it's, not, it's, very, e it's very hard to decide what material actually provides enough slippage to, to drive and which is, uh, is very loose material. And uh, seeing the wheels helps the operator to, uh, to decide what, uh, what is a good uh, situation and uh, where it needs to do something more fancy. Also, it, it helps to, um, once you have driving, driven around, you, it's very helpful to decide, you know, do you want to have like, like a pilot and a co-pilot situation, or do you want to have like, uh, maybe something else that could help um, the operator to drive safely in this environment? And also, the question, how does, uh, how does the delay, delay uh, impact the, um, the operation of the rover in that environment? Another thing that we talked about uh, 31, 31st uh, C3 was the drop containers, which are actually those little triangular structures that are sitting below um, the solar panel, which can be deployed on the surface. And so one of the critical tests of an analog mission simulation for us would be to test that this actually works. You know, you have it sitting in a lab, and um, you're, like, you're pushing a button, and it falls down, and you're like, OK, this works. But once it gets into uh, in touch with reality, you know, their plan will probably not work out as planned. So, you know, it's, it's difficult to predict whether, it, you know, in which ways it can fail. And the idea of the mission simulation is to, to find all the ways it could possibly fail and also be, have, the, have the operator si sitting in the mission control figure out in which way it failed to find the procedures to, to deal with it. This is actually the toughest part, you know. There are people uh, standing behind the rover and uh, they see that uh, how it failed. But the people sitting in the mission control, which are far away, also need to figure out in which way it failed. And this is a very tough thing. So in order to, uh, to improve the uh, ensure that, that we can operate safely on the moon, uh, we need to design a mission control which can actually provide useful information to the operators, and um, we need to find out which ways are the best way to, to visualize those. And so in the end, um, this is what the analog mission simulation is all about. We collect data, you know, in terms of uh, telemetry data coming from the rover itself, which can be helpful to, um, to, uh, to adjust some parameters, you know, like uh, knowing the power consumption, in what situation was the power consumption, and maybe optimize it. Uh, but also, where does the process get stuck? You know, once you're um, once you're done with the, uh, where where could be the process be optimized that your that the operator get more information about uh, the uh, well what is happening on the uh, on the moon surface and. Uh, also, what were the technical problems that, uh, that we encountered? And um, those, those technical problems need to be addressed, and the process uh, problems need to be addressed as well in the way that there is some definition on how we actually can uh, you know, allow people to join in and uh, do stuff like this. Um, I just realized I was talking much faster than I expected. <laughs> Um, but there is uh, one last video I want to show you because uh, what, another thing that we just announced in June is um, that we have now partnered up with Audi. They are supporting us. And uh, we also did a very nice video about, uh, about our mission. And I want to show you that. Ton?
states, countries. Okay, let me, let me, sorry, let me start that again. The moon, our closest neighbor in the solar system. And yet, it has always seemed distant and unreachable until now. Now, a private team of engineers is working to change that forever. They come from different backgrounds, countries, and fields of expertise. But what unites them is true pioneering spirit and the will to try the impossible. Who are these guys? They are the part-time scientists, and they are full-time crazy. Audi engineers are supporting them to build and test the Audi Lunar Quattro to make it ready for the moon's challenges in the context of the Google Lunar X Prize. Together, we will take collaboration and teamwork further and reach for the stars. Wherever this mission may take us, together we are following the true meaning of Horsprung der Technik. Join the part-time scientists on their mission, the mission to the moon. Yeah, so uh, you, can, you can visit that site. You can visit the site missiontothemoon.com. Um, you will find some, some pretty cool information about our mission. It also gets updated frequently. So, for example, one of the things that we did test um, quite recently was the, the thermal environment. So, we went to a test stand at Audi where you could actually put the rover into a, like a really huge thermal chamber. And we, we looked at how the thermal. Uh, how the outside temperature is affecting the, uh, the rover itself and how the, we, we made a bed that heats up to 120 degrees Celsius. And we also made sure that you know, the, power, uh, the, the heat is dissipated in the ways that we anticipated to, to be dissipated oh, wow, uh, from the rover on the moon. So um, yeah, unfortunately, I was really way too quick because I did some miscalculation. But, if you have any questions, um, feel free to ask. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, there's already one question standing at that microphone. So maybe you want to start, and everybody else who has a question can go to the microphones. They are here in the front. And everybody else, please keep seated until the end of the Q&A. Thank you. You're, 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 hello. Yeah. Uh, about the video, you, you want to stream high definition video back to Earth before your uh, rover uh, breaks down due to temperature issues. Yeah. Um, how, is there also an orbiter around the moon then to actually uh, relay that to Earth, or do you have another way of uh, well having enough energy to uh, because it takes a lot of bandwidth? Uh, uh, do you have a plan for that? Yeah. Well, the um, the idea is to actually have the rover transmit the data. Um, Either through the lander um, to Earth or through the uh, through the rover itself. So um, the lander could act as a relay. You know, having a satellite in orbit doesn't make that much of a difference. You know, because most of the time it's not visible, and so you can't use it as a relay. Um, so we, the plan is to have the direct communication with Earth, which is preferably. And you can get. Uh, it's not that much data that you actually need to send down. You know, with uh, with. So some, this is uh, some of the things that we tested uh, when we, for example, went to Tenerife. Is how much data rate do you actually need? You know, uh, so you, there are some things that make life easier. For example, that everything is gray uh, except for the flag of the Apollo lander or so, uh, Apollo landing or something like this. Um, and yeah, it's uh, there's nothing except the rover moves. So this helps with uh, with a prediction for the um, H.264 algorithms, uh, and so yeah, with two megabit we already get a pretty decent picture. Um, we try to currently try to squeeze out a little bit more uh, more quality of it. Yeah. Thank you. I think there's another question. Or. Oh. Yeah. Um, okay. I'm just asking. Um, you are developing it, uh, or the the rover, with uh, uh, yeah, a very big uh, car producer. So, are you able to um, use any parts or modules or techniques of them? And 
then are you able to compare the test with uh, tests they made, maybe with cars or something like that? Or are you totally um, yeah, developing and from scratch and have to uh, um, yeah, just uh, work for your own test values? Well, it's very tough to compare our rover to a car, yeah. um, mostly because of the lacking gasoline engine. Um, but uh, also, so the thing is that um, the, the concept of having, for example, the Quattro technologies is, uh, is very similar in our rover. You have four wheels which can be independently uh, uh, adjusted. And so we can take the technology that is in the Quattro and put it into our rover, which is why the, it's called Audi Luna Quattro. And also, Audi is helping us to reduce weight. They have uh, tremendous... Uh, base of knowledge for for reducing weight, and they also have amazing test sites where you can uh, put the rover onto and uh, and do some tests. You know, some are more useful, some are less useful. Yeah, like uh, the North Pole one is probably not that helpful, but you know, Sahara Desert or something like this is uh, always very helpful. Okay, thank so yeah, in the end, the idea is that um, we are challenging the Audi engineers to. Um, to think a bit out of, of, out of the box, you know, this is not the ordinary project. It's a little bit like in the Formula One where, um, where the engineers are developing technology that will not go into the car itself, but, uh, you know, thinking about the extremes uh, makes it more interesting. Another question from that microphone, please. How are you going to test the rover for its uh, stability against uh, radiation. How are you going to test on Earth whether the rover will survive the radiation environment <coughs> during the flight and on the moon? Well, so the, um, the answer is that you can actually um, calculate the radiation that, uh, that you're expecting for the mission. And um, so the most radiation is collected uh, on the way to, um, to the moon. On the moon surface, you have just like one rod per day, which is like almost nothing. A little bit more than nothing, but um, yeah, it's uh, it's not that much. And so, what you the only thing you can do is you can actually um, you know use a regular Cobalt 60 that you have laying around and put your uh, electronics in front of it and see how it, uh, how it's affected by the total loss. And also go to particular accelerators and uh, put it into the beam and see whether single event effects uh, kick in. Uh, in your video, you have shown uh, an Atmel chip being soldered to a board. Is Atmel really selling space-grade components? Of course not, no. Uh, or maybe. Uh, actually, they do. They have this one FPGA that is totally outdated that they're actually selling. Uh, also, they, are, they have a very interesting... They have another processor. So, yes, they are selling uh, space-grade components. Uh, but we're not using any of those. Um, they, so, the, the, the thing is, we don't want to have you know, space-qualified components. We just want to have components that work. And uh, the way it is is that we, um, we will develop our own um, PCBs, and then we do a full radiation test with those and see whether they fail or not. And it's actually, you know, for example, if you have a very small, um, if you have very small uh, processors, then um, the chances that you will, uh, you will be affected by single event effects um, gets less and less because the cross section of the bit uh, is actually remained the same, but the die size got smaller and smaller. So the chances are, uh, are getting better with new technologies for us. I think there's just another question there. Uh, yes. Um, uh, in the advertisement uh, of this talk, there was a uh, simulation about analog versus digital and about analog simulation of uh, missions, but I didn't see much in that in the result of the talk. Uh, can you may maybe explain a little bit more about, about analog simulation in the uh, context of missions? Well, the, the, the problem is um, it's, uh, it's analog in the sense that you re can't recreate the full mission on Earth. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's impossible. You know, it's, uh, it's impossible to get one-sixth of gravity, and it's impossible to, uh, to have the radiation environment, the, the, the thermal environment, and the gravitation, and the surface uh, with, the, with the magnetic field and static, uh, static load, everything at once, at the same time, on Earth. 
And so what you're trying to achieve is to make, um, to make something that is as close as you can get on Earth. Uh, for example, the, but the problem is what you usually run to is that you're developing a component uh, in your lab and it's working in the lab perfectly, but then you're, then you're putting it into the field and you're realizing that uh, your solution has all kinds of problems. Uh, some, of, some of them are technical ones, but others are, you know, trivial ones. For example, that, you know, the, for example, the drop container um, f falls down perfectly when, you're sitting, when it's sitting on a desk because it's uh, perfectly straight. And then you realize, okay, when the rover is uh, standing a little uphill or there's a little twist, and then, you know, uh, in the rover or chassis, then it might fail. And uh, those are the, the kind of things that you want to catch with the analog mission simulation. Um, this is, you, know, you can't always go to Tenerife to do the testing, so those um, analog mission simulations are actually rather expensive. Uh, so you want to make sure that everything you do there is carefully prepared, and you find uh, the, more, the more bugs you find, the better it is in some way, because then you have found them. You know, if everything works as planned, you don't know whether it was pure luck or perfect planning, so, yeah. Thank you. I think that were all questions. And thank you again, Carsten Becker. Um, yeah. Just a short notice. So we are in the Space Village. Um, there are some other cool space guys that you could meet. Um, we are also making, you know, some kind of... Uh, we are inviting everyone to be there at like 7 p.m. this evening. Uh, we have some drinks and uh, some snacks, and yeah, you're welcome to, to get there, uh, ask us questions, and uh, have a chat with space guys. Thanks. <laughs>